Let's bring on Sarah Ellis, who will tell us a few words about the Royal Shakespeare Theater and her experience there this past year and prior. Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. And I've unmuted myself in that classic Zoom etiquette that we are now faced with um, in pandemic times. Um, and firstly, to say thank you to everyone who's spoken so far. It's been really, really brilliant to hear all these different perspectives and feel part of a community. I think one of the um, really, really um, big sort of positive things that have come through such a difficult time is, is how we've come together globally and locally and, and shared our ideas and practice it. I work for the Royal Shakespeare Company and my job is to uh, work as part of the artistic team to imagine theatre not only for the present but for the future and equip us uh, with all the new cutting edge technologies, but more, more than that, actually um, say, what, um, what is the theatre making toolkit? And, um, and then how do we extend that theatre making toolkit for artists so that when they're making work um, for, for our stage, um, and this is a, a LIDAR scan, which I'll talk more about uh, shortly, but when they're making work for our stage, we're thinking about all the stages that are now possible to us in this digital age. Um, and it's important to say, um, we've experienced a huge amount of accelerated disruption. Our theatres have been closed since March, the middle of March this year. Um, and with that, in, in that time, we've seen huge amounts of change and impact on, our, on ourselves and also our theatre communities. And um, we've worked in solidarity across ourselves as an organisation, but also as a sector and all the freelancers that we work with and the actors that we work with and all of those communities to, to come through this together. Um, and when you're innovating, um, which we've done for quite a long time, um, this form of accelerated disruption makes you really think about what is possible and, and how that change can, can be positive and, and hopeful. Um, we've not been able to get into our theatre, but behind me is... Um, a LIDAR scan of our theatres and it's important to say um, this isn't a photograph, this is a scanned image um, that has been rendered into a games engine and we are and because we were um, closed we were able to get into the theatre and scan all our buildings and we hope that will be a positive reaction to um, to what we've experienced by being closed that we have now been able to make a virtual stage. Um, this has come through um, a fund and a project called Audience of the Future. And, and it's quite right to say that we were looking at this before the COVID pandemic hit earlier this year. Um, and the Audience of the Future project is um, to imagine the future of live performance. And we've been doing that in collaboration, not just as a theatre company, but working in collaboration with other other organisations that deliver live performance, Manchester International Festival, the Philharmonia Orchestra, Punch Drunk and Marshmallow Laser Feast. And by working not just with theatres, we're able to imagine live performance in a lot more of a holistic way. And working in partnership with technology companies and research partners has allowed us to place evidence at the heart and data at the heart of what we're researching and developing because we were due to do a performance of A Midsummer Night's Dream in June in Stratford um, using cutting edge real-time technology and headsets, and that wasn't possible. So since that moment, we've had to reimagine what that performance could be in your home and potentially look at the performance not in Stratford-upon-Avon or not only in Stratford-upon-Avon, but looking at your home as a destination for live performance. And for us to achieve that, we have to ask our audiences what technology they have, what their needs are, and, and how they can experience this with us. Because to come to this space, we have so many rituals and understandings of audience, but to go to, go to your home and be with you in your home with live performance, we need to understand that more. And through that research, what we've learned is um, that the inequity around digital technology is quite high. So the higher you innovate, it doesn't make it more inclusive or accessible. And we have to really understand the technology that is in people's homes, um, including infrastructural needs such as um, internet connection, um, the, the, the variability of that, the also different models that people have. But what we also asked is what do audiences need right now? And overwhelmingly people came back to us and said togetherness, 
and liveness. And it's in the spirit of that that I think that how we look at navigating innovation right now, we really must listen to our audiences and where they're at and think about how we bring those strengths of live performance and theatre out of out of our buildings and into people's homes but not as an either or but as uh, but actually how do we provide togetherness ourselves and how we make this work and how do we make sure that all our performances have the spirit of what our stages are about and not losing the promise of what theatre is and so to hear that people wanted togetherness and liveness is not just about the most cutting edge technology. It's about how you integrate those new technologies. And don't forget that the innovation technology, paper was a technology, candlelight was a technology. But when we stopped calling it a technology and started calling it a tool is so important for us to understand. And it's how we converge those technologies together and how we don't lose an audience because we've made something that they can't access and they don't feel part of is so crucial to what the promise of theatre is about and what the promise of the arts is about. So we have this really, really crucial time at the moment to not to look at accelerated disruption, absolutely see the um, benefits of accelerated disruption, but also not um, lose a mainstream audience as well as an emerging audience and then appropriate that to the technologies that we have in our disposal to make this work more accessible. So the technologies that we are really excited by right now are less about a headset and much more about connection. How do we create more connected technology technologies that use connection to help us. So we're very interested in our prototyping real-time motion capture, using that in game engine and looking at desktop and mobile as our, our most tactile, how can we make those devices as tactile as they can possibly be? So how can we get you to think about, about your screen, not just as a passive experience, but as something that you can go into as, as an experience too. And within that, what we're looking at is um, we need to do a huge amount of work to understand the possibilities of what these 3D virtual environments can give us now that aren't the same, that they are different, but they work alongside what we know already. And to think about us as globally programming now, that we are putting out work to audiences who can be anywhere and experience this at any time. So how do we look at changing our scheduling to schedule at times that are available to a US community or an Asia community as well as a Europe community are really important, but also that those um, people who are experiencing our work at the same time feel connected. And I've seen some wonderful work from the theatre community do that um, by simple opening of an envelope at the same time and everyone knowing that they're doing it together. And it's within that spirit that we're looking at our accelerated disruption and not losing that promise, but also remembering that theatre has always had a relationship with technology. The printing press has enabled Shakespeare's plays to be performed now. We don't forget that, we hold on to that. And how do we extend this data making toolkit for artists? Because if you put technology in the hands of artists, amazing things are possible. That's so true. Um, thank you, Sarah. And I think that is so important to remember. We think of technology and the word future flashes in our mind. But of course, technology is, you know, it's, it is a piece of paper, right? Technology is a candle. Um, Bernard Stiegler, the theorist who we lost this summer, his thought on techne was that it is this desire vector. It is a human who then animates a tool and the tool can be, you know, a technology is how to peel a clementine so you can eat what's inside. And I really think it's so important as we go forward to not see um, mocap suits or any kind of virtual reality or any of these kinds of things as something that's a foreign future. It's just humans who are putting to, or making a new tool and it's humans who will create that bridge as well. Um, 
We are now going to, before we get into a Q&A, and I already see there is one question, thank you for this. We are going to uh, speak uh, with Nicole McNeely so that we can put you two in dialogue with the questions. Um, and uh, just to uh, to recap, uh, Nicole McNeely is uh, the Impact Advisor of the Europeana Foundation, and she will present the result of her research regarding the digital divide, both within EU member states and globally. So um, thank you, Nicole McNeely. I think you're, you're calling in now from The Hague. Is that right? It is, yes. And I'm but you're Irish. Great. <laughs> I am Irish, yes. I'm from Northern Ireland. Um, so I will do my best to cover a lot of content. Um, I am so thrilled to be here and I have really enjoyed the presentations already. Um, so thank you to everyone for having us here. Um, I'm representing Europeana today, um, but cultural relations is a real fire in my belly. Um, and this is a really timely opportunity to think about the shared lessons that we can draw between uh, the acceler accelerated digitization and digitalization of cultural heritage and the field of international cultural relations. And of course, digital transformation in these areas are intimately interlinked. And a lot of the themes I just, I'll discuss have already been mentioned by the speakers who preceded me. And I'm happy to add some extra context to this as well. So first, a bit about Europeana and our vision and our mission. We are Europe's civic space. We are Europe's platform for digital cultural heritage. We have a vision of a cultural heritage sector powered by digital and a Europe powered by culture, giving it a resilient, growing economy increased employment, improved well-being, and a sense of European identity. And our mission, well, at the very core of our mission is digital transformation of the cultural heritage sector. So we develop um, the expertise, the tools to embrace digital change and to encourage partnerships that foster innovation. We make it easier for people to use cultural heritage for education, for research, creation, and recreation. And our work contributes to an open and knowledgeable society. And I realized I hadn't turned my slides on, so we'll start here. Um, where can you find Europeana? Well, Europeana is not just a website. We're not just uh, an organization based in The Hague. Um, we're an initiative, we're an ecosystem, uh, and we're a network. We work across two different sites on Europeana collections at the top. Uh, you can browse curated editorial made from Europe's cultural heritage, or you can dive deep into a whole collection of over 52 million items. And I checked this morning, there's around 4,000 institutions represented from across the EU. And partnership working is, is critical to this. We work with over 100 partners to deliver this site. And on the site at the bottom, you can find um, specialist resources developed for the sector and for the European Network Association, which is a, a multidisciplinary network of more than 3,000 professionals that really help us drive the Europeana initiative. And so digital transformation is a process that enables us to achieve our vision. And it's with this in mind that we plan how we deliver our mission. So in the Europeana strategy, 2020 to 2025, for the cultural heritage sector, digital transformation is not just about technology or assets or how we operate. It's about mindsets, it's about people, and it's about skills. And as we've heard from the speakers today, digital is not an end goal in itself. Um, it's a continual process. And just as technology and society changes, we also have to adapt and grow. But this year, heritage institutions, like the rest of the world, are being forced to adapt to an accelerated period of change uh, of accelerated period of digital change brought about by the restrictions introduced and necessitated by COVID-19. After our initial response to COVID, we and uh, the sector, our network, we needed the headspace to reflect and to think about the challenges, the opportunities, and what this means in the medium term and the longer term. And so, we brought in experts skilled in facilitating workshops to surface the key issues and the key opportunities within the digital transformation agenda. So 64 participants from 22 countries took part over three weeks in June 2020. And we published these reports in September. Um, we're now working on those recommendations and the next steps. So from the reports, three things really stood out to us. First, the digital divide. 
the need for a sense of agency to bring about change, and the need for collaboration. But today I'll focus on the digital divide and what that means for digital transformation. So what do we know about the digital divide? Well, the digital divide is bigger than we think, and we can see this in four different ways. It's between those who can access, who are represented, and who feel welcomed by cultural heritage and digital cultural heritage, and those who don't. It runs between countries and regions who have well-articulated digital strategies and infrastructures, and between those who don't. It runs between institutions in a country, Institutions can have differing levels of digital cap uh, capacity and cap capabilities and drive. And it runs within institutions because the digital divide is as much about process as it is about mindsets. And as we can see divides between and um, within people um, as much as how we adopt different software. And so today um, I'll think about what this looks like in the museum sector. Um, if I had more time, I'd also uh, give some statistics about the library sector. Um, just to illustrate that within the heritage sector, there's a really, di really diverse context that we're working in. So in the museum sector, um, NEMO, the Network of European Museum Organisations, conducted a survey published in May 2020, earlier this year, that showed how museums were responding to the crisis. So we see a fast response to increasing online activity. People are using social media much more than before, and it's reported as the most popular online media activity. Virtual tours and online exhibitions have also increased, but the services that require time, resources and skills are the ones that have increased the least. We also see that around 80% of museums have changed staff tasks to accommodate, to, to accommodate current needs. So one case, for example, is Nina Tekra, the video on demand platform of the National Film Archive and Audiovisual Institute in Poland. It provides free access to Polish audiovisual masterpieces, films, documentaries, theatre, for example. And in the first few uh, months of the crisis, it experienced a really strong boost in users wanting to explore their collections, uh, 10 times as many users compared to this time last year. And in response to this, FINA made temporary internal shifts, making sure that the editorial team were supported uh, to meet this digital this increased digital demand and thus capable of uh, delivering content that would meet this interest. Staff moved from programming the building to programming online. And so from this case um, and from the data, we see that many museums are responding to and adapting to change. But we also see that the digital divide uh, we also see the digital divide in the response of other organisations where heritage professionals that see the changes needed, but don't necessarily have the skills needed to deliver this. And it's important to remember that not all heritage organisations will survive the crisis. According to the OECD, it's along with the tourism sector, it's estimated that between one um, and five percent of jobs that are, are at risk. So. Context then in a context of digital transformation is super important. What is small for one organization, one experienced uh, digital organization might be a giant leap for another less digi digitally mature organization. And for us, it's really important that we start leveling the playing field. So what do we learn about digital transformation Oh, COVID-19. I realise, sorry, my slides have not been on at all, have they? <laughs> um, no, they've been on. Your slides have been on. You're all set. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, great. It shows differently on my screen. Sorry. Uh, okay. So what do we learn about digital transformation, COVID-19 and the digital divide? Well, we see that the more you put in, the more you get back. The report by Nemo find a relationship between what is invested and what you get in return. We also see that technology changes fast, but that implementing and embedding digital or new methods of using digital takes time. And understanding the impact of COVID-19 on the heritage sector's practices will be a long-term thing. So for example, in the theme of this conference, we in the past nine months have seen little change to how AI is being used by organizations, but that's 
only because it's only been nine months. Change takes time. But the OECD also say in their September reports, and I quote directly, there's an opportunity for a major innovation breakthrough in terms of the deployment of state-of-the-art technologies that allow presence at a distance. So the value of immersive digital technologies and cultural heritage has been put in focus, but the digital divide remains a barrier. And the digital divide, however, is, is not a binary between those who can and those who can't. Mistakes are normal. And perhaps COVID-19 pushed some people to take risks that they might not have done to reach their audiences. So this is exactly the time where we need to stop and think and to decide on our next steps. Okay, thank you very much, uh, sorry, Nicole. You, oh, you're I, still, oh, I thought you sorry, were. I just, <laughs> no, sorry, I had a few, um, I, sorry, a few um, shared final uh, points. I just want to double check on my, on my screen. It really doesn't show my slides. So yeah, 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 you're right, you're right, you're right. It does. So I have five very, very quick points to make. Um, so what can we learn about the common challenges and opportunities? Well, digital won't replace an organization's bread and butter work. Um, while COVID is changing, operating models, the future relies on an exploitation of blended experiences, but it won't replace the physical or strolling through an exhibition. And like today, I may have done a better in-person uh, presentation than online. But the digitalization of an organization's processes can lead to greater efficiencies and more time for exploratory work. And the scale of who you reach, the numbers, doesn't always equal the same impact. But there are unlimited new ways to engage your audiences. Uh, through digital engagement. And I'm interested, for example, in how we understand the differences in the intensity of our experiences online versus in person. And digital crosses interdisciplinary and geographic barriers. I recently started a project, European XX, referring to the 20th century, is planning to work with four different unit clusters to create subtitle of forms where students or interested members of the public come together to work on subtitles to make the audiovisual heritage of the 20th century more accessible to different in different countries and to different, different people. But at the same time, regulation, like the licensing of online culture can be a barrier in different ways. And really importantly, and brought up by several of the speakers today, we need to keep thinking about who is included and who is excluded. This is the digital divide. And this is just as relevant in cultural relations as it is in digital cultural heritage. And digital can mitigate and create its own environmental problems. Just because we're not meeting in person doesn't mean we're not having an environmental impact. Increased digital use has implications for the environment through electricity use and electronic waste. And we also need to keep this in mind. So I'll finish today with one point made by our technical director last week um, at the Europeana 2020 conference. Why don't we create a cultural sector wide long-term vision for digital transformation, like we see in the cultural field, uh, the climate field, for example. And technology is here. We, we are able to use it and we will be able to embed this, but we need to remember also that technology is not the aim. It's a tool for us to remain in dialogue with our audiences. And with this, um, I think never before has our culture and our heritage have so much, had so much potential to support a fundamentally open and creative society. We need this potential to be met with supportive legislative frameworks, European and national strategies and substantial funding so that Europe is not left behind in this period of accelerated digital transformation. And with that, I am definitely finished. So <laughs> thank you very much. Sorry about the, uh, the, the challenges in the middle there. Thank you, Nicole McNeely um, from Europeana Foundation. Also, I wanted to say it seems that uh, Europeana Foundation manages far more institutes and in digital artifacts than we uh, originally stated oh, from our research. I think you said 50 million now and 4,000 institutes. Yeah, that's more than yeah, we had so <laughs> Yeah, um, it's yeah. order of magnitude or so. Yeah, <laughs> higher. It's, uh, yeah. Um, no since we have just a few minutes now before our keynote from Sabina Verhein, so um, I want to bring Sarah Ellis also back on the page. No, with Nicole Pedro, if we could have both Nicole and Sarah together, um, and uh, maybe bring Sarah also. Great. Okay, cool. And I mean, this is also something, of course, we're, we're, we're trying to choreograph this, right? Like we would choreograph a real stage, but 
everybody sees something different on their screen. If you're watching via YouTube or Facebook, you're seeing a different interface than if you're joining in on Zoom or if you're one of the participants. So it's a good reminder that like everybody sees from a slightly different view, right? Um, in any case, let's just jump right to some of the questions that have been submitted by listeners. Um, and maybe we open it up to Sarah first, but then Nicole, if you have something to add, please do. Um, so Walter Gare writes, Thank you for sharing the Royal Shakespeare Company's point of view. What are the most promising tools to promote togetherness? And does that maybe I even mean, show up? I, I would also uh, like to, yeah, maybe just to expand a, a bit is, uh, I mean, what, what, in what ways does theater as a medium uh, you offer unique potential for uh, empathy building and connection that's essential in this time right now? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think the best storytelling technology there is as an actor uh, to be really frank, and that emotional connection that you can achieve with um, with gesture, with with um, with interpretation of a narrative, and I think we mustn't forget that right now. So the tools that are most promising are the tools that enable that most, and the tools that can champion that most. But what's different in this space is in the space that we're in. We have so many cultural norms of understood togetherness and liveness here. And we're also sat there captivated. Um, if you think that the lighting and sound doesn't impact on your um, direction of, of view, if you don't think those mechanics of theatre aren't taking you on that crafted journey, which is delivered by a director, a designer, the performers, the music, all of that comes together. And that's kind of been completely fractured when we're experiencing a form of theatre like this remotely. And we need to put those pieces back together or we need to put pieces in a different way to, to find that togetherness. And I think what's really crucial is the most promising tools are the tools that enable that, not the tools that overtake that. Um, and I think it's really important that we work in concert with artists at this moment because it's also our preconception about those tools. Motion capture technology, for example, was used in healthcare at the very beginning. We're using it as puppetry. That's not, do you see what I mean? So it's how those tools get appropriated into an artistic framework. Um, and that needs time, that needs R&D, that needs thinking, um, it needs audiences. So for me, some of the most promising tools are, are pieces of paper and pens right now, as well as the most cutting edge um, game engine technology the, where we can create show control, um, live motion captured show control in game engine and remotely have a performance. But that performance doesn't have, if that doesn't have a heartbeat, if that doesn't have a soul, if that doesn't have a story that takes audiences with you, those tools aren't the aren't the best use. And that's a really important thing to say. I think that narrative building is such is so key. And we see right now with the mainstream media, one of the major failures is its inability to craft a convincing narrative. And so it really is falling to cultural organizations to create tolerant, progressive, understanding narratives. Um, and obviously theater is one of the oldest tools we have for that. So um, thank you, Sarah, for, for that further information. I think we have one question for Nicole, and then we are going to pivot to Sabina Verein quickly, um, but yes. Yeah, uh, Nicole, I, I just wanted to ask you, I, I can imagine as, as uh, institutions that uh, start uh, offering programs that are sort of open globally, uh, especially with things like film, I can imagine copyright licensing offers uh, some unique challenges. Um, I wonder if there's any recommendation, action points, or anything in the work uh, that sort of uh, might span the institutions across the EU and make it easier for these uh, copyright licensing regulatory hurdles to be uh, overcome? It's a really good question. And yes, there's always the challenge of once you get something made digital, well, then who does that digital artifact belong to? Who? Um, but actually, there, across the EU, there's, there can be a lot of a lack of consistency about how countries um, approach digital content, for example. Um, so on your piano, we have some resources that help people think about actually how can they make their content available, not just available online, but also available as openly as possible. And we have a public domain charter where we advocate that anything that is in the public domain that in, in real life digitally should also be in, with the same copyright, uh, with the same open, openly accessible to everyone. Um, 
We also, and coming back to the theme of the conference as well with AI, there's an ongoing debate about actually what about the artifacts of the artwork that's created by uh, artificial intelligence? Should they be digitized? And we don't have a position on this, but it's a really interesting uh, ongoing debate. Um, but yeah, I recommend to go to your piano, uh, to pro.yourpiano.eu. There's a lot of um, resources there to think about how you can make your content not just available online, but available so that audiences can really um, benefit from this. Thank you, Nicole. And I want to also include, there's been a comment by Dr. Stefanos Valiantnatos, um, who is speaking, I guess, to both of you um, about this question of the digital divide. He says, very valid and interesting points. In this respect, just being the devil's advocate, uh, this can also slow progress if we are to include everyone, whereas there are individuals, companies, institutions that are keen on pushing things forward and would be disengaged and alienated from a slower speed or process. So that does seem like a very good point. Um, uh, definitely, we need to be mindful of those who are left out of the digital divide, but we also need to make pathways that allow uh, experimentation to happen without too many policy hindrances. I don't know if you want a very short final comment before we, uh, your thoughts on that, um, but just 30 seconds. Uh, I would like to jump in and say that I don't think the arts is homogenized and I think that there's space for all. And I think that um, what we must champion is research and development because that's where the experimentation happens. Um, and I think that we, a, a brilliant artistic program is one that connects with many audiences in different ways and 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 you and that is and that is and that is how you achieve it uh, and I think that the experimentation is is super important actually and it in impacts it impacts on so much I, I think we I, I personally think at the RSC we talk about it in its broader like all of those things in the broadest sense um I think at difficult times though it has to justify itself more um, and I think that's what sometimes we see. But um, but I think we would never have achieved the Tempest in 2016 with the first time that we had a real time motion captured avatar, digital avatar on stage performing with live actors without that experiment and invitation, innovation. However, when it landed in that space, it needed to be accessible. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is that we needed to make sure it made sense to our audiences to, to, to have a successful run so and reach the multitude of audiences. So it's it's how it's how they work together, actually, um, I think is super important. Yep. New models, we think a lot about scale and scope and how yeah. uh, what's appropriate at one scale is not necessarily appropriate at a larger scale and vice versa. Um, and so that is something to be mindful of. 